Go ahead and grab a seat as you sit down. Grab your Bible, grab your notes, grab a pen. I'm going to have you write down five words today, just five words. They're five action verbs that we're going to take here this morning. You know, if you've been here for the past several weeks, we're in a series, a sermon series. The name of the series is Life's Rhythms and Blues. Um, Real quick, raise your hand if you have ever had any blues in your life. Yes, we all have. We all have. We've all had those times of blues, those times of being down, those times of being depressed. And one of the things we quickly realize, I uh, mentioned to you at the beginning of this series, that you really are in good company if you have been blue in your life, if you've been down or depressed. Uh, first of all, we talked about Elijah, the prophet Elijah, and he went through a time of deep, deep depression. We've talked about several other people, including King David. And David, all throughout the Psalms, you see times of depression, but exactly then what he does during those times of depression. King Saul was a depressed man. We all also saw that Nehemiah wept when he saw the devastation that had happened to his people. And on and on and on we go through Scripture and we see those people in those times of depression, which is why we're talking about the blues. But the good news is we go to God's Word here and we see what to do during those times and how that God has given us practices. God has given us things to put into our life that continually point us to Him. Real quick, word of caution, word of caution. As we go through this series and we look at the different rhythms that we put into practice, be careful not to worship the rhythm itself, but to continue to focus on the one who is worthy of our worship. Amen? Amen. All right, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to continue on here this morning. The name of the sermon today is called The Rhythm of Rising Up. And some of you are going, is that a thinly veiled attempt to mention the Falcons? Yes, it is, okay? But that's not what we're going to talk about here this morning. Let's begin with a word of prayer. And Heavenly Father, again, again, thank you so much for allowing us to be your children, that we can indeed call you Father, a Father that we know loves us and cares for us and is even concerned with us when we are in these days that are dark. Father, during those times, my prayer is that each one of us would look to you and not away from you. We would draw closer to you, that in you we would find our help, in you alone. Help us now to see that, to know that, to do that. No matter where we're at, no matter what we're feeling here this morning, thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so we look to the writing of King David in the Psalms. Psalms chapter 40 and three short verses here this morning. As we look at these three short verses, not only do we see David depressed, but we see what he does when he is down, when he is depressed, when he is in the pit. And that's what I'm going to have you write down here in just a moment. But we begin in verse 1, and he writes, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. I want to pause right there for a moment and talk about that cry. One of the most popular TV advertisements ever included a phrase, and the phrase was this, Help me, I've fallen. And I can't get up. Yes, you know it. You know it well. And you remember the picture and the woman who had fallen down and she hits her life alert and she gets help when she needs help. Somebody heard her cry. But I wonder here this morning if anybody has heard your cry. What would the cry of your heart be here today? This past week, this past month, this past year, have you also felt like David here. I've fallen and I I don't know what to do about it. I can't seem to get back up. I'm down. I'm depressed. I'm in a dark place. I'm in a lot of pain. I'm hurting. I'm struggling. I don't know what to do with all that. How do I get help? Who is out there who will hear my cry? Is there anybody? Help me, please. I've fallen. I can't get up. I don't know what to do. Statistics say that very, very many of us 
go through exactly that. In fact, in the last 15 years, prescriptions for antidepressants have more than doubled what they were 15 years ago. America is deeply, deeply depressed. Statistics show that mainly, or more, is among women than it is men. However, quickly catching up are men between the ages of 45 and 62. And doctors are a little bit baffled. They don't know quite why, what's going on. The generation with the most depressed are those now we know as millennials, those that are young. And so depression now is breaking all barriers and all, all boundaries than we once knew it before. More and more people are finding themselves depressed and more and more psychologists are going, maybe it's this or maybe it's this. We don't quite know the reason for the increase in such depression. They point to stress. We're stressed out. We've got so much going on. They point to lack of relationships, meaningful relationships, and instead we replace our relationships with the, uh, the virtual relationships. They point to comparisons, are comparing ourselves to one another and all the social media that goes with that. They point to all these different things, and they prescribe all these different things. And certainly we can find help for a lot of the symptoms, but is there any hope for us to really get to the root? Is there any hope for us to really get to the root of the problem and discover what it really is and to find healing and to find help even there? I believe that's what we find here in God's Word. David, as he writes, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also writes, he also brought me up, up, out of the horrible pit. I want you to circle the words horrible pit. And as I continue to read, I want you to define the pit that you find yourself in, because there are a lot of different pits that might be here today. Is it the pit of depression? Is it the pit of worry? Is it the pit of fear? Is it the pit of doubt? Is it the pit of self-pity? Is it the pit of broken relationships? And we can go on and on, but for you, what might that pit be, that one that you would call, it's horrible, because our hope is here. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. In other words, as he does this, then it will be a testimony to even those around you, to all those around you, of the goodness of our God. So what do we do when we are down? What did David do when he found himself down? And we see this all throughout the Psalms. There are several things that he put into practice, what we call rhythms, several things that you do over and over, several things that you have determined, this will be my go-to, no matter where it is, no matter what I'm feeling, when I'm here, this is where I will go. This is what I'll put into practice. This is what I will do. Now, as I get ready to write these down, let me just go ahead and say that these will, as you write them down, they're all action verbs, but they're all going to seem extremely counterintuitive. What do I mean by that? I mean, when you write these down, it's going to be probably exactly the opposite of what you would feel like doing when you are in that pit of despair, when you find yourself down. Now, it'll seem weird. It'll seem strange. It'll seem bizarre. It will seem not the, the normal thing to do. I want to warn you with that. But it's what we find David doing during these times. So here they are this morning. I'm going to give, going to give you five. We're going to move through them pretty quick, and then I'm going to get you out of here. We'll be ready to go. The first one I want you to write down is simply this. Number one, wait. Wait. David said, I waited patiently. Wait. How many of you love to wait? <laughs> no. We don't like to wait. Uh, it just drives us nuts, man. I mean, I don't, I don't want to wait. I want to wait in line at the grocery store. I don't want to wait in traffic. I don't want to wait for the doctor. I don't want to, I don't like to wait. Anything but wait. Wait drives me crazy, right? But here, David says, wait. I waited. I waited. Oftentimes, God tells you, wait, wait. When you cry out to him, I'm in, I'm in despair. 
I'm hurting. I'm in pain. God, where are you? And he comes back with, just wait. Just wait. Uh, it seems completely the opposite of what we should do. You see, I'm a fix-it guy. Any other fix-it guys or gals in here? Yeah, if there's a problem, I'm going to fix it. And so to wait, that's completely the opposite of what I want to do. I want to I maybe go uh, figure out this or go do this. Or, and so often it's simply pulling out my phone. At least I'm doing something, right? But he says, wait, wait. What does it mean, though, to wait? What does it mean to wait patiently for the Lord? The image I get, the image, and I think it's a good image to get here, is, is, uh, is, is what my wife is able to do with our dogs, okay? Um, it, it's absolutely amazing to me. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a little tiny black miniature uh, poodle, weighs about eight pounds, and then we also have two giant Labradoodles, uh, one at 70 pounds and one about 80 pounds, giant big dogs, you know? And so all these dogs are in our house. It can get pretty chaotic at times, but every once in a while, my wife will go uh, grab a little tiny thing called a treat. And that treat, with that treat, she's able to do some amazing things. She takes this little tiny treat, and these giant dogs suddenly stop in their tracks, and they sit. And they get this glassy look in their eyes. And, and Kim, she's, she's done this. It's, it's amazing because we're all in the kitchen. It's, 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 it's Kim, the dogs, and me. And she'll say, wait. And I'm like. <laughs> and, and the dogs are like that as well. And, and then she'll, she'll say, uh, uh, Charlie, you wait. And Charlie will continue sitting there. Charlie, you wait. Charlie, you wait. And she'll say, now, Louie, you come. And Louie comes, and Charlie waits. And then she'll say, Louie, now you wait. And, and, and Charlie, you come. And then Charlie will come. And, and it's all for this treat. And she says, Bo, wait, wait. <laughs> okay. I'm like, where's my treat? Where's my treat? You know? But it's amazing. It's amazing. What, is, what does that wait look like? Wait for God. It's actually taking that time to look and, and stare at him expectantly. Hey, do you see that? It's, it's, it's stopping and, 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 and just uh, looking, focusing, uh, directing your attention to him and only him expectantly or with hope, knowing that he is a good God and he has something good that he has waiting for you. That's what David's saying, I waited, I, I was in the pit, but I waited patiently. I kept looking to him, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined his ear to me. Psalms 46, 10 says, be still, be still, be still and know that I am God. When I was a kid, I used to like Westerns. Anybody like Westerns? Remember the Westerns? And my favorite was the Lone Ranger. Anybody remember the Lone Ranger? I love the Lone Ranger. And there are those other Westerns like Bonanza. Anybody remember Bonanza? And yeah, all those, all those great Westerns out there. Well, if you ever watched Westerns back in the day, you knew that the, the, there was this peril that, that plagued uh, the West. And a lot of cowboys fell into it. It was called quicksand. How many remember quicksand? Yeah, man, I, always, I was amazed by quicksand. I remember going playing in my backyard like, watch out for quicksand, you know. <laughs> you don't want to fall into quicksand because you fall into quicksand, you might be a goner, right? And so you had to watch out for all this quicksand. And, uh, but, but you also knew this, you learned this on, on the, on the cowboy, that, that if you did ever fall in quicksand, what do you do? You, you got to be real still, don't you? You got to be real still because if you start flailing about and if you start, then, then it just sucks you under that much quicker, right? That's what happens with quicksand. You got to be still. And it's, you see, it's extremely counterintuitive, but in the same way, when we find ourselves in that pit, what do we want to do? We want to whine. We want to complain. We, we get upset. We want to get angry. We want to get mad. We start flailing about. But, but here we find, wait, be still, be still, be still, be still, be still. Be still and know that I am God, he says. And, and another thing, have you ever thought that maybe for a moment that God has allowed you to be in that pit for a reason? That pit in which you find yourself, could it be that God has allowed you to be in that pit and there's a purpose for you to be in that pit? I'm going to tell you a story. 
There's a story my dad used to love to tell, and he told it really well, but I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to tell it to you to, to do it justice, okay? But uh, uh, the story is like this. There once, uh, there was this old, old farmer who was walking the town one day down an old dirt road, and as he was walking the town down this old dirt road, it was cold outside, freezing cold, he happened to notice a little baby bird, a little baby bird that had fallen out of its nest, and it was there by the side of the road, and and it was just shivering in the cold and freezing. And the kind farmer thought to himself, well, this poor bird's not going to make it much longer unless I do something. But I, I really can't take it with me to, to town. And maybe, maybe and he came up with an idea. He, he noticed that, that there was a, a fresh pile of horse manure right there on the road. And he thought to himself, well, here's what I'll do. And he carefully scooped up the little baby bird and, 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 and went over and took a stick and kind of hollowed out a little place in the middle of the, the, the manure and dropped the little baby bird down in the middle of the manure and then just kind of piled the manure up all around its, its neck and just to where the top of his head was showing. And he thought, well, I'll, I'll go and, and this bird will warm up here and I'll get it when it comes back and, and be able to go rescue him. And so he, he, he leaves and the little bird stuck there in the manure right up to its neck. But it's nice. It's kind of warm, you know, and he's, he's feeling a lot better than he used to, and, and things aren't going so bad. And so as the bird is there, he starts to, starts to chirp and starts to make a little bit of noise. And, and la- the warmer he gets, the louder he begins to chirp right there in the middle of this manure. And, well, wouldn't you know, there's a, there's a fox not too far away. The fox hears the chirping of the baby bird and, and, and quickly runs over and eats it. The end. That's a good story, huh? <laughs> no, no, but you see, there are some morals to this story, okay? Uh, here are the three morals to this story. You ready? Number one, when you find yourself up to your eyeballs in manure, it's not necessarily an enemy who put you there. Number two, when you find yourself up to your eyeballs in manure, it's not necessarily going to be a friend who gets you out. And number three, when you find yourself up to your eyeballs in manure, sometimes it's best to keep your big mouth shut. <laughs> so, 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 so you see, there, could, it be, could it be that sometimes God has a purpose for your pit? Uh, I, it's, it's funny, this, uh, um, this series has... Uh, and, and it is. I think sometimes God allows me to speak on something only to uh, let me go through it so I can learn it all the more. But, but understanding dark days and stress and, and, and depression sometimes, and, and uh, these things hit close to home. And, but, but one of the things I've discovered about myself is I, 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 I always cry out louder and I draw closer to the Lord during my dark days. During my dark days. You see, for me, sometimes if things are going easy and smooth and there's no problem, I have this tendency to kind of go, hey, uh, man, I'm so busy, uh, I'll catch you later, okay? But oh my goodness, not when the stress is on, not when the pressure's there. Then it's, oh, I need you, Lord. Oh, Lord God, I need you, I need you. I'm desperate. And so often it's, it's that moment of, hey, wait a second. You just wait right here. Wait and look at me. Be still and know that I am God. Learning to wait, and that's wait. Wait is number one, but now here's the second thing that I want, I want you to write down. Number two, the second action verb is humble. Humble. I, I, I know, even as I said that, and our minds were going, that's an adjective. That's not an action verb. And it really is kind of one of the things that we know more as an adjective describing somebody rather than the action verb of humble. But but look what it says, James 4.10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Remember we were saying all this seems so counterintuitive? This one right here certainly is counterintuitive, especially in the culture in which we live. Isn't that right? I mean, just look out on the landscape 
across this world. Uh, uh, if you're going to be a good politician, well, you can't be humble. You got to talk about all the great things you do. If you're going to be a, a good uh, athlete, when you dunk the ball, you beat your chest, man. When you catch the ball in the end zone, you do a little dance and mock everybody. No, you're not going to be humble. Not if you're an athlete. Not, you're not going to be. And, and, and that is what's spoken to us all over the place is, no, exalt yourself. Lift yourself up. Talk about how great you are. Tell everybody how great you are. Tell yourself how great you are. But here we see something very, very different. He says, humble yourself. If you want to be lifted up, let him do the heavy lifting. You humble yourself. You humble yourself. What does it mean to humble ourselves? I believe humbling ourselves involves this. Humbling ourselves involves when we take notice of who he really is. And we also look at what we really deserve. And then we see what he was willing to do for us. Do you follow me there? We take notice of who he really is, which is why so often in the songs that we're singing, we're singing, then sings my soul, uh, my God, how great thou art, how great thou art. We're talking about him and how amazing he is. But then to see ourselves for who we really are, what we really deserve, you see, you see, the most miserable people in life are the people who go from, well, I deserve better, and I deserve this, and I deserve this, and I deserve this. But when we really see what we really deserve, you see, Isaiah put it this way. He said, all our best, all our best efforts are as filthy rags. We might think there's something special, but... In God's sight compared to God? Nah. No. And so what do I really deserve? When I read here a moment ago, out of the miry clay, if you're from Georgia and I say the word clay, you think something specific, don't you? What color is it? Red. red. Yeah. Red Georgia clay. And man, I spent some days in red Georgia clay. When I was a kid, it was back behind our house, and I would run out there and all day. It was like this big, uh, this big pit or the, where uh, there's a valley that would go down, and there's a creek in the bottom of it, and it was just red Georgia clay all down the banks. And I would climb down there, and I'd spend the day looking for crawdads and, and salamanders, flipping over every rock that I could, trying to catch everything that I could. And, and then it, got, it started to get to be evening, and I'd hear that call from my mom out the sliding back door. She'd yell, Dinner! Yeah, I didn't want to miss dinner, man, so I'd take off running. And I'd run to the house, and I'd get to the house, and, man, I had messed up my shoes. I had messed up my jeans. I had messed up, and, and my dad would always do this. He'd come to the back door, and there I am standing with all this red Georgia clay all over me. And, and he'd always make this joke. He, he, he'd yell to my mom. He'd go, hey, 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 Babs, I think it'd be easier to make a new kid than to clean this one up. <laughs> yeah, that's funny, that. yeah. that's funny. So funny. All right, let me in, you know. And uh, after a little while, they'd hose me off, and, and then I'm invited to come in and eat at the dinner table, you know. What am I saying by all of that? I said, you know what, if we really get a good look at ourselves, we really need some cleaning up. We need some cleaning up. When we look at who we are and what we've done, we look at our sins, we have a real evaluation in comparison to God, yeah, we get a real, real good look at what we really deserve. But then, but then we're amazed, we're humbled when we see what he was willing to go through to bring us into the family of God. Jesus sacrificing himself on the cross for all my filth, for all my filth to bring me into the family. You can only, 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 when you see all that, when you look at that, when you know that, when you realize, you can only but be humbled, humbled. Humbled to the point that he says, now I'll lift you up, depending on me. Humble, number three, the word here is honor, honor, honor. Psalms 30, verse one, 
It says, I will honor you highly, O Lord, because you have pulled me out of the pit and have not let my enemies rejoice over me. Over and over in Psalms 40, you notice he's pointing to him. He says, he, 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 he did this for me. He did this for me. I didn't do it for myself. I can't get myself out of the pit, but he does this. And because he does this, I will live my life. I will honor him with everything that I am. How do we honor God? With two things, two things. And you've got both of these things. With your body, with your body. How many of you got a body? Good, I can tell you raised a hand. Yeah, you got a body. Good. With your body and with your stuff. With your stuff. How many of you got stuff? Yeah. We got lots of stuff, don't we? But what do you do with that stuff, with your possessions? How do you, first of all, with my body. How do I honor God with my body? With what I think, with what I allow in my mind. With what I what I watch, with what I listen to, with what I look at on the computer, is an honoring to God? With what I say, with my speech, with where I take this body, with if I go over here, if I go to this place, even when I think nobody will know, am I honoring God with this body, with how I work? Do I honor God by doing a good job? With my body, I honor God. But then also with my stuff. Do I honor God with my possessions? Do I honor God with my money? Do I honor God with the things that I have, with what I call mine? It says right here in Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, honor the Lord with your possessions. Sometimes I think that the pit that we find ourselves in are simply pits that we've dug ourselves because we've failed to honor God with those areas of our lives. And so often we find people who will go from pit to pit to pit to pit. I call them pit hoppers. They're in one pit and They'll say, please help me get out of this pit. And somebody will come along very graciously and they'll give them a hand or they'll help to get them out of that pit only to suddenly watch them go to simply another pit and they find themselves there again and they go from pit to pit to pit to pit in despair all their life, failing to see that they've been the very ones digging those pits deeper themselves. Why do they dig those pits? Because they're looking for happiness in this or they're looking for happiness in this and they keep on digging. Maybe this is going to do it. Maybe this is going to do it. And they fail to look to where true happiness comes from. They fail to ever stop and look to the one who can deliver them from the pits. And so I have to ask myself, am I truly honoring God with this body? Honoring God is saying, you've got dibs on this body. You can do with this body whatever you want. You make the calls. You, you call the shots. You direct my life, my steps, where it is that you want me to go. Take this body and use it for your honor and for your glory. Honor God with my body. Honor God with my stuff, with everything that I have. God, I realize it's all come from you in the first place. And anything that I have... Let me honor you with this. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me tell you guys, I, I have spent some time with some of the richest people I know. Now, here's the deal. Some of the richest people I know can, are also some of the most miserable people I know. And some of the richest people I know are also some of the happiest people I know. You know what that means? That happiness is not determined by what you have. But by what you give. Are you a giver? Are you taking what you have? And are you faithful with that? I want you to notice something right here. Look what it says. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty. How many of you have barns? Anybody? No. Most of us don't. Okay. 
and your vats will overflow. How many of you have vats at your house? There's like a few of you. Okay, good. But look, and your vats will overflow with new wine. Um, I circle the word wine, if you will. And, and just know this, that anytime you, you see the word wine throughout Scripture here, often it represents, you know what wine represents? Joy. Joy. And so what he's saying right here, honor God with your first fruits. Honor God with what you have, your stuff. And he says, your vats, your joy will overflow, is what he's saying. You're going to find joy that starts to overflow in your life. Case in point, going through Walmart yesterday. And I look over to my right, and I see a good old buddy of mine. His name is Steve. And, and Steve is a Big guy, uh, bald head, long goatee, balder head than mine and longer goatee than mine. And I'm like, Steve, how you doing, man? And Steve comes up and, and he hugs me and I say, how are things going? And he's got the biggest smile on his face and I know why. I know exactly why. Steve is standing next to another guy and he goes, let me introduce. And this happens every time I see Steve. It happened at Christmas time and he's loading up his truck full of bicycles to be able to take out to, to some kids who, who don't have bikes. And, but this guy, he introduces me to this guy and I can see this guy has a handful of stuff that Steve has picked out for him in their shirts and there's pants and there are work boots and Steve's getting this guy ready to be able to get a job and get him back on his feet. And Steve, Steve was one of the happiest guys I know. And I know why. Because he continues to live in such a way that he's honoring God with whatever it is he has and his wine is overflowing. His wine is overflowing. Honor, honor. And then number four. Number four, sing, sing. How many of you are singers? Any singers? Let me ask this again. All of you should raise your hand. How many of you are singers? Huh? Okay, good, good. You need to sing. You need to sing. Psalms 33, 3, sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. It's interesting because David up here, what happens he set my feet upon a rock, established my steps. He put a new song in my mouth. And you sing, you sing. Hey, hey, let me, let me, you, want me, you want me to tell you who my favorite singer in the world is? Can anybody guess? Okay. Yeah, somebody actually got it. My favorite singer in the world is my wife, Kim. It is, it is. Now, I know some of you are like, oh, my goodness, Pastor, you never told us your wife could sing. Uh, I'm not telling you she can, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying she's my favorite singer. Um, <laughs> she'll tell you that. No, no, you, you'll, I promise you'll probably never, ever hear her sing, okay? But I get to hear her sing, and the only way I get to hear her sing is when I sneak into the house, she doesn't know I'm there, and she, she does this all the time. She's got her, these headphones she puts on her head, and when she's working around the house, whatever it is, maybe she's cleaning or something like that, and she's got her headphones on, and she is singing. I mean, singing, you know? <laughs> she is. She's singing. <laughs> and I, I hear her sing, and I just sometimes just listen to her sing. I was like, wow, check that out. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's my favorite. It's my favorite. It's not good, but it's my favorite, you know? Um, yeah. But you know why it's my... <laughs> she is so going to kill me today. <laughs> you, you know why it's my favorite? You know why it's my favorite is because, because she turns on songs of praise and she sings to the Lord and her praises fill up our house. That's something good to come home to, guys. A heart that sings. A heart that sings praises to the Lord. Do you sing for joy? Isn't that funny that it says sing for joy, not sing because you're joyful? Sing in joy. Sing, sing, sing for joy. When you're in despair, I challenge you, start singing praises to the Lord. 
regardless of where you're at, regardless of what you're going through, just start singing praises to the Lord. Start singing praises. Sing. It says sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. Now, this whole play skillfully part, you know what that means to me? Um, I can't play a thing. Um, I can't play a piano. I can't play, I, uh, you know, I can't, I can't play an instrument at all. And so how in the world am I going to be able to play skillfully and, and do what this verse is telling me to do? The only way that I can do that is when I come and I let the guys who know how to play skillfully play skillfully. And we worship together. We worship together, which is why it's, have you ever noticed, have you ever noticed what a good singer you are when everybody else is singing with you? You, right? Right? I mean, you're a star. And, uh, but, but think about that. That's why we need each other. That's why church is so very important. Worshiping together is so very important. That's why it's so important to be here. And why, why dads, dads, that's why it's important for you to, you to be here singing and, and that, that, that child of yours looking over going, wow, dad's singing to God. Wow, mom's singing to God. That's why it's so important we sing together and we encourage each other. And, we, and, and there are those who play and they, they urge it on. And it's so much better when we do it all together. We worship the Lord together. But, 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 but that's what we do. We come. That's why I need church. That's why I need to be in worship for that joy that comes as I worship him alongside you guys. One of Kim's favorite songs that she sings. Yeah, some of you might, might have heard this before, but, uh, but uh, uh, one of her favorite songs that she sings to her headphones has been, uh, years past, is a song by a group called Mary Mary. How many of you know Mary Mary? Yeah. And, and the name of the song is Shackles. Anybody know that song? Yeah. And, this, and the words to it are so great. Get the shackles off my feet so I can dance. You don't want to pray. Yeah, you can't help but dance. You can't help but dance to that song, right? And when you start to sing... And you can't help but find joy as you're singing that song to the Lord. And that really is the last thing I need you to write down is dance. Dance. That's it. Dance. I know, I know. You write that down, some of you are going, uh, Pastor, I don't dance. I just don't. I don't dance. And, and I want to warn you. I want to I warn you there. Be, be careful uh, of, of living life too dignified. Okay. Be careful of living. Save dignity for death, okay? You can be a real stiff then, okay? All right, all right. But while you're here on earth, man, take time to dance. Take time to dance, to really dance. When I, when, when I, my first day in kindergarten, my very first day in kindergarten, um, I, the teacher left the room. You know what I did? I got on the table and danced. I was dancing because I was so happy, happy to be at school. Little did I know, school is nothing to dance about, okay? <laughs> but you dance when you're happy, which, which brings up the problem. How do you dance when you don't feel like it? How do you dance when you... Remember I said it's all counterintuitive. Psalms 87, 7 says, They that sing as well as they that dance shall say... All my, fount, all my joy is in you. Let them praise him in the dance. How do you dance, though, when you don't, don't feel like, I, 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 here's how. I noticed something in Psalms 40. It says, David says, he set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. Established my steps. Twelve. 13 years ago, I asked a young lady out on a date. It was my daughter, Madison. She agreed to go with me, and I put on a suit, and I don't put on a suit for nobody. She put on her dress, and we hopped into the car and we drove to a nice restaurant and sat there and ate, enjoyed our meal. And then we drove from there to the daddy-daughter dance. We get to the daddy-daughter dance and there's a DJ out there mixing. And, and all, the, all the little girls, Madison and her buddies, are, get out there on the dance floor and they're all dancing around and with each other, having a great time. All us dads are just kind of standing back like, 
Yeah. Around the edge. But then the, 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 the DJ says, okay, okay, guys, we're going to slow it down here for, for a minute. And, and what I want is all the dads to go find their daughter and, 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 and take this slow dance with them. And I went and found Madison, and, and I took her hand, and the DJ began to play some song about Cinderella. And, hmm. You know. I took her hand and put, put this arm around her back, and she did what, what so many daughters will do with their dads, and, and she stepped up on top of my feet. And then it was my job, you see, as, as dad to, to move my legs, and, <laughs> and we began to dance to this song. She leaned in close and put her head right here, and we danced for the duration of this song trying to keep it together as a dad. <laughs> and then finally, the song was over, and she stepped off and, and lifted her head up. And it was when she lifted her head up, I looked down, and, and I had a big wet spot right here. And I realized she had been crying the whole time. Tears of sorrow? <laughs> Maybe a couple for, for, you know, growing up so fast and... But more than that, tears of, of joy. Joy that comes from a relationship. Do you see? Your joy in life comes from a relationship. And when you find yourself at a place where I just don't feel like it, all you got to do, draw closer to him, draw closer to your father, and let him do the dancing for you, knowing that you have one who adores you, adores you as his child. He, he will set your footsteps. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will bring you up out of the pits, and you will rejoice. Let's pray. You know where I'm going now. I said it's about relationship. How do you have that relationship? It's only through Jesus. It's only through Jesus. It's only through Jesus. Friend, if you've never asked Jesus into your heart for the forgiveness of your sin, please hear now. That's where the relationship comes from. Just right where you sit, quietly in your own mind, you might pray, Jesus, I do believe that you died for me on the cross. And right now, the best I know how I want to receive you as my Savior. Come into my life and forgive me of my sin and be my God, my Savior, my friend, forever and ever. And thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. There begins the relationship for all eternity that can never, ever be broken. You have a Father in heaven who adores you, calls you his own, his child. Father, thank you for that. Again, thank you for letting us call you Father, for loving us the way that you do. When we are in the pit, let us call out to you. Let us cry out to you. Let us draw close to you. Let us praise you. Let us sing. Let us dance for you. And you will set our feet on the rock named Jesus Christ. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.